Good evening. Welcome to the Pearl Report. I'm Diana Lin. Kung Fu, or martial arts in Chinese, made its way from mainland China to Hong Kong starting in the 1920s and 30s as people left to find a better life. Kung Fu flourished in Hong Kong, developing many hybridized styles. Producer Melissa Hekolea met with masters of the prominent lineages to look at the heydays of Kung Fu past and the uncertainties of the future. Lam Chun Fai, age 75, was born in Hong Kong. He's a master of the southern Chinese kung fu style called Hung Kun. The waist and stance are powerful and solid, but Hung Kun also has a soft side. The soft movements are fast and agile, which is Hung Kun, watch a few moves and you'd know. Which is Wing Chun? Of course, you have to know Kung Fu, which is northern style, which is praying mantis. If you're a layman, you can't distinguish one from the other. At the age of five, I started learning Kung Fu from my father. Chun Fai's father, Lam Cho, an orphan, was adopted by Cho's uncle, Lam Sai Wing, once the revered chief kung fu instructor of the Kuomintang Army in Fujian province. Because of my father's influence, going to school was less important. In that generation, practicing kung fu was paramount. I was very weak when I was young, but after I practiced Kung Fu, I became stronger and I got more involved, more interested. A son should succeed a father, so it was strictly mandatory. I had to learn it. This photo, my great-great-uncle, Lam Sai Wing, I think this photo should be 100 years ago. He shot this photo when he was maybe 40 or 40-something. 40 Chun Fai's granduncle Lam Sai Wing was a protege of the legendary Wang Fei Hung, who popularized Hung Kun in the 20th century. Wang and Lam have been ubiquitous subjects of Hong Kong kung fu movies and TV dramas. In the 1920s, Lam Sai Wing and Lam Cho moved here from Fujian province to heed a call by the Hong Kong Meat Association to teach Kung Fu, a common practice then for industries to train staff in martial arts. Originally, they wanted to invite Wang Fei Hong, but Wang Fei Hong um, asked his student Lam Sai Wing to come instead uh, because he was too old at the time. Hing Chow is a writer and expert in Southern Kung Fu styles. Lam Chun Fai is Hing's Hung Kun teacher, also called Sifu or Master. I would reserve the term Grandmaster to the father or teacher of my teacher. Because people tend to use uh, Grandmasters, uh, both in English and unfortunately in Chinese, rather inaccurately today. It's a great master and therefore it's a Grandmaster, it's wrong. It's completely wrong. The Lam family, on the one hand, they have preserved the inherited teachings, but they have also played a very critical role in bridging um, the gap with northern martial arts. Through Nam Mu, a martial arts institute founded by Lam Sai Wing. Through this institution, they brought about an unprecedented, I would say, level exchange between northern martial arts and southern martial arts, which in turn um, were instrumental in creating more hybridized styles of martial arts, which are unique to Hong Kong. It invited Ken Takai to teach here. Ken founded the northern style Taishing Pekwar. Its saber routine is now part of Hong Kun. This is considered one of the signature repertoire in Lam family Hong Kun today. Lam Cho and Gun Dahai, they were lifelong friends. A lot of their students exchanged techniques through observation. 
particularly when they have learned from the counterpart from the other style. The Second World War. The Japanese occupied Hong Kong. The Japanese occupation was chaotic times. Robberies were rampant, nothing to eat. The Lambs were running a few Kung Fu schools by then. People urged my father to come forth with his protégés to protect the community. They didn't have guns, only sticks. It was like neighborhood vigilantes. He'd protect he would stick his vigilante's name on the door. Many gave my dad face and didn't rob all those who stuck my dad's name up. After the war, Lam Chun Fai began teaching Kung Fu. He was about 12 years old. I helped my father to teach as an assistant. Taught at four studios. One was in the Blue House in Wan Chai. At 15 to 16, I became a proper Sifu, and I opened my own Kung Fu studio. Before, people learned Kung Fu to protect home and country. We had 60 to 70 students every night. Now it's like a sport to boost physical fitness. After a few lessons, some students feared hardship, some lost interest. Soon, only a few remained. You can't make a decent living teaching Kung Fu. Lam Sifu has been teaching Hung Kun for 60 years. Masters and students from all over the world come to his tiny flat in North Point to learn from him. Foreign students are many times more persevering than Hong Kong people in learning Kung Fu and passionate in practicing it. So I now have many more foreign students than Hong Kong students. Lam travels the world giving seminars on Hong Kun. His students follow him back to Hong Kong. Massimo has been practicing Kung Fu for 25 years. Twelve years ago, he began studying Hong Kun under Lam Chun Fai. Massimo has opened four Hong Kun studios in Italy. The Sifu Chun Fai gives me the possibility to have the black uniform of our style. And he told me, OK, now you can also teach in Italy and uh, because now you are Sifu of our style. Pavrel teaches Hong Kun in the Czech Republic. He says his interest in Kung Fu came from the movies. In 2000, he began coming to Hong Kong twice a year to learn Hong Kun. Long family, Kung Fu, it's not only a sport. It's a health, self-defense, some spiritual de development, uh, history, culture, many things together. Very extraordinary. Lam, son of Lam Chun Fai. I believe if my dad had forced me to learn when I was young, my Kung Fu would be much better now. When I was young, not only did I dislike Kung Fu, but all sports. Until he turned 16. He later became more interested. I didn't need to force him. The Lambs and their students were out in force at the recent launch of the book, Hong Kun Fundamentals. When I come out, people don't know I'm Oscar Lam Chun Ho, only that I'm Lam Chong Fai's son, Lam Cho's grandson. There are actually things I want to do, but I worry it affects my family's reputation. For instance, I wanted to ring fights, but my family objected. People always think knowing Kung Fu means you can fight. Actually, it doesn't. I tell my students not to get into a fight easily, only if it's unavoidable.
Kwok Wan Ping, age 75, says as a boy in Guangdong province, he practiced martial arts to protect himself. When I was 15, 16 years old, I was weak and often bullied by others. So I pushed myself and I became muscular for a few years. Kwok attended Guangzhou Sports Institute after high school. In 1960, Kwok won the Chinese National Championship in Tai Chi and became a Sifu. He also started learning Wing Chun, another Southern Kung Fu style. Kwok's Sifu is Shum Neng. His grandmaster, Yun Kei Shan, was among the first masters of Wing Chun in Fo Shan, a contemporary of Yip Man. There were a lot of people like Ip Man in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s who came to Hong Kong and were more established because they were professional teachers before they even came to Hong Kong than Ip Man. But Ip Man catapulted to fame. Obvious reason is Bruce Lee. Everyone asked who is the teacher of this great martial artist and the answer was Ip Man. We tried our best to practice, didn't dare slack off. Wing Chun has 12 hand techniques. We have to do each move at least 100 times. For 12 hand techniques, we'll have to practice 1,200 times. My Kung Fu stream is Feng Xu Xing. Sifu taught me until 1967, when I found a chance to escape to Hong Kong. Joining legions of mainlanders fleeing the Cultural Revolution. Martial arts was seen by the Red Guards as a relic of the past. In Hong Kong, Kwok Wan Ping, then age 27, worked in a factory and taught Kung Fu in his spare time in parks around Kowloon. I had no place to teach. I was very poor. I moonlighted, teaching in the morning or at night. In 1969, I opened my Kung Fu studio here. Still here, never moved. We had 20-something people in a class. In the 70s, Hong Kong students were willing to practice because there wasn't much entertainment. Youths today have changed. They've lots to play with, so they don't practice hard. They fear hardship. Wing Chun is starting to go extinct. I worry about this. Up next, can the masters keep their family's kung fu legacies alive? Dang Jing Lefer actually expect me to be his successor. Now I say, yeah, okay, yes. And that single word, yes, means uh, it's a big burden on my shoulder. This and more when the Pearl Report returns. Welcome back to the Pearl Report. Some popular Kung Fu styles are dying out with their aging masters as public interest wanes. Experts say Kung Fu is at a critical juncture in Hong Kong and keeping it alive is a challenge for many Sifus. Four states of the training. Build up your own strength. Relax yourself first before you can move. After we build the form, speed. And that has to combine with the strength and the flexibility that we really can do things quick and attack and hit. We don't know what's coming. When it comes, it comes. Right? And also win means we will be from an internal power, the chi. Hong Kong-born Michael Tang is an engineer. He designed this velodrome in Chung Kwan O, as well as Pacific Place and the Convention and Exhibition Center in Hong Kong. In Macau, he did the Wynn and Galaxy Resorts. In the world of martial arts, 63-year-old Michael is a master of Wing Chun, a southern Chinese kung fu style. He teaches it in his spare time. I came from a relatively poor family. I only started formal training in 1968 when I was 17 years old. It is not I choose Wing Chun. I would say possibly Wing Chun chosen me. 
Michael is the grand nephew of Tang Yik, a renowned Wing Chun master. Tang Yik, he was very conservative, very selective uh, in his choice of uh, disciples, and hence it, 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 it was and still remains a very much family affair. <laughs> The old-time Chinese like martial artists, they really want to have the technique hand down to someone that has family linkage. Tang Yik didn't have his uh, family around here. Tang Yik's wife was killed and his son went missing in the Second World War. So he left his village near Foshan and moved to Hong Kong to be with his closest living relatives, Michael Tang and his dad. Wing Chun masters, most of whom um, came originally from Fasan area in Guangdong province. They cluster around Yao Ma Dei at a market called Dai Dat Lang. They included Tang Yik, Ip Man, Chu Chung Man, and Lo Chi Wun. They held regular discussions and they probably learned one of two things from each other. And they were good friends? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They left a fight. At those times, people, when they are on the same kind of similar or same style, they respect each other. Tang Yik started at 10 learning Wing Chun from his parents, both martial artists. His father was dubbed King of the Pole in Fo Shan, referring to the long pole, Wing Chun's only weapon. Tang Yik inherited the title. It's seven movements. This is a half point, Jin, Si, Chang, Tan, Chou, Tik, God. So it makes up the fundamental movements. Tang Yik was also nicknamed Mad B. So it's the B that stings you. His footwork is very much like Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. right? Fly like a butterfly yeah. and sting like a bee. This is one of our very fundamental movement. It's called Da Samsing. Like hitting three stars. Wing Chun came from Shaolin monks in Fujian province. In the mid-17th century, they came under prolonged attacks by the emperor's troops from the north. The monk in charge of the uh, teaching of martial arts in Shaolin, the southern Shaolin, right? He fled to Guangdong. And he was chased after by the uh, emperor's guardsmen. Along the way, the monks spread Wing Chun to many other southerners to fight back northern invaders. The southern China is a smaller one. Then the uh, lot of them people, if I do this way, if there's a strict punch, he's stronger, he's taller, bigger, he would easily overpower me. Right. See how we hit. We do a lot of hand roll out. Right. Our technique is pretty lethal. That's why the, uh, what, they, what Deng Yik worry is, unless people have a good control, Right. Even if it still do not want to kill someone, by accidentally, he may kill somebody. Michael says Tang Yik used to avoid taking on students with links to triads. Old days, Kung Fu practicing a lot of time is related with fighting, with possibly triad gangsters. So if your student or his students do something bad, that bad luck could come back to him. When Tang Yik was in his 70s... He actually once called me in and asked me, the techniques are good, very good, and this is the family art, so please keep it for him. And I say, yeah, OK, yes. And that single word, yes, means uh, it's a big burden on my shoulder. A lot of the old masters are still around. Mm -hmm. Many of them are above 70. Mm -hmm. So we are in a very critical juncture. What are we going to do with this knowledge? And what we decide to do with this knowledge and whether or not these masters have the opportunity to actually pass down the inherited teachings will determine whether Hong Kong will continue to be a hub for Chinese martial arts.
Michael has two grown children who are not interested in kung fu at all. They have their, their regular life. They have business. They, they have work. It's a bit of a real pity that overseas people seem to have more passion than Chinese. Hong Kong people would become a pressurized and too much distraction, actually. Michael is looking overseas to keep Kung Fu alive. I retired from my engineering profession and spent a bit of time traveling to Europe. There are quite a lot of people, Westerners, now find interest in the form because they heard of Deng Yik's name. When they compare our form with uh, the uh, Wing Chun, they find it's a different expression. The Tang's Wing Chun is from Fei Loi Temple in Guangdong, but there are many other Wing Chun styles. The way in which the Wing component of Wing Chun is written for um, the Yip Man and Guo Wan Ping lineages compared to uh, the style practiced by Tan Yik and his descendants, which is written with Wing, a ruse to, um, to disguise the true identity of the Wing Chun practitioners. There was no um, fundamental difference between the two styles. I really want to share my knowledge that I've been uh, attaining through my years of training with Deng Yik. Important to me personally because it's my promise to Deng Yik. Practicing from him would, I would say, be instrumental to how I develop my character. Michael's mission now is to find a successor. Do you think you'll be able to find a protege here in Hong Kong, or do you have a feeling it will be outside? It depends on fate. The 75 Wing Chun master Kwok Wan Ping has a successor, his own son. When I was six, seven years old, father guided me to practice some Kung Fu for physical fitness or to have another tool to protect myself. My interest grew as I practiced Kung Fu. When I was small, I got prizes if I did well. If I did badly, I was scolded. Around 15, 16, he started showing interest. He's practiced for some 20 years. Now he helps me teach. I send him out. This is grand pupil. Grand pupil, great grand pupil, fourth generation. I have tried my best to teach my son and my students all I've learned and practiced. I know I'm not as strong physically as I was, as they are now. I don't fight anymore. I teach less. As a professional, I'll teach until I can no longer move. I prefer doing Tai Chi. A Wing Chun drill is short, but it's not as good as Tai Chi for physical fitness. Tai Chi moves are big and they stretch, so practicing takes longer. The method is more sophisticated and the sticky hand requires a lot of touch and feel. The speed, the gestures, are denser, faster. People are less persevering than in the older days. Wing Chun is easy to learn but hard to master. I want to keep the spirit. I hope to preserve this martial arts style. If I have kids, I'll try my best to teach them. Well, thank you for watching our show. It will be re-aired on Tuesday and Saturday, as well as on TVB.com. Until next time, from the Pearl Report team, good night, good luck, and good health.
evening. Welcome to the Per Report. I'm Diana Lin. Dozens of Chinese martial arts styles are being practiced in Hong Kong, but most people are familiar with just a few that have become part of popular culture. Many other styles have vanished as practitioners lose interest. In the second of our two-part series, producer Melissa Hekolea looks at lesser-known Kung Fu and how keeping them relevant might ensure their survival. The southern praying mantis originated in the hills of Fujian province. Due to the hilly terrain, there are less footwork and jumping, but more hand gestures, more short distance release of strength, not wide and long. I am Li Tin Loy of the East River Chao family praying mantis. I was born in 1954 at Sha Tin's township office. I grew up in a Sha Tin village. I started to learn Kung Fu at 16. At 19, Li joined the Marine Police and looked for a Kung Fu master. I'm Hakka. I heard people talking about the different styles of Hakka Kung Fu. I'd heard about my Sifu Yip Shui for a long time. By chance, I saw Sifu's signboard here in Mong Kok. Li was 24 when he finally became Yip Shui's disciple. Yip Shui's master, Lao Sui, was dubbed East River Tiger for his southern praying mantis expertise. For seven years, Li spent his free time practicing with Yip Sifu. I usually went to him after work. And on his days off... At 11 a.m., I'd practice Kung Fu until 1 p.m. I would have lunch with my Sifu. After that, at 3 p.m., I practiced again until 5 or 6 p.m. After Sifu officially retired in 1989, I went to Sifu's place every month to Yam Cha. In the old days, people treated their Sifu as their father, as teacher father. Earlier generations even lived and ate together, helped to boil tea, sweep floors and cook. The older generation distinctively classified student, disciple and apprentice. The new generation calls Sifu coach. Hing Chao is a martial arts practitioner and founder of the International Goshu Association and the Hong Kong International Kung Fu Festival. Both seek to preserve martial arts. International Kung Fu Festival is intended to be a cross-sector collaboration to show people what martial arts means, what are the differences between Kung Fu, historical development of martial arts. And martial Ordinarily, in the past, we we'll observe a student over a period of time before deciding whether or not to take him on board. If he decides to do that, then he will impart all the skills, all the secrets to that disciple. Oh, I'm not. Go. The East River Chao family praying mantis style came from the Shaolin Temple in Fujian province in the late 1700s. Its founder, Chao Anam, was actually a Hakka from Guangdong province. When he was young, he worked in the kitchen of the Shaolin Temple. While chopping wood, he saw a praying mantis fighting with an acacia bird. Finally, the bird was injured and fell to the ground. He felt very surprised to see such a small praying mantis defeating an acacia bird. Later, he caught some praying mantises. He used sticks of grass to provoke them to see how they fought. He then integrated the moves into Fujian's southern boxing style. From this, he developed southern praying mantis, which was taught among the Hakka. Hakkas were based in the north but moved south. 
Many plains were already occupied by locals. To survive, whether by intellect or aggression, hackers practiced kung fu that can be integrated into daily life. This hand wringing is like how people used to ground rice and grains. This hand holding on to here, lifting the basin. And this is like carrying things on a pole over your shoulder. These movements come from everyday work. Under master Lei Tinloi and his martial arts brothers, the training techniques, the tradition of um, Southern Praying Mountains is being kept very much true to tradition. And that is rare, even though they do not have a lot of followers in Hong Kong, the students they have tend to be of high standard. Doing anything well involves Kung Fu. In order to become good at martial arts, it requires dedication of your spirit to the art form. To learn like a toddler, like you're learning how to walk and do the horse stance. Then you do the san shou. After that, you could do the set of kung fu. They're very tiring, boring. The main thing is whether you could withstand the boredom. Lee teaches at the Hong Kong Chinese Martial Arts Association, where he is currently executive director. I don't need many students. Like here, I'm teaching two to three people, sometimes 14, my maximum quota. If I teach a large class of students and they can't pass it on, can't get the form right, it's useless, however many pupils you teach. Traditionally, Chinese parents would send intransigent children to learn from a kung fu master. They expect the martial artists to instill a sense of um, discipline and correct behavior and respect into the students. So I think these are macro, micro um, uh, community levels in which martial artists continue to play a role in society today. <laughs> I have a student who started learning Kung Fu from me as a teenager. I'm very strict with my disciples. After he had fought for a while and understood, he is now very obedient. When he was naughty, his mom used to call me. The naughty boy won't listen to anything I say. Sifu, help me scold him. He's now a very good boy. I wasn't very obedient, but I'm not a bad guy. Following my Sifu feeling his love, he made me grow up gradually, reverting to the right path. Before I was immature, my former self wouldn't do volunteer work. Now when I have time, I would visit the elderly. Founding master Chao Anam predicted Southern Praying Mantis would last seven generations. Our family of Kung Fu has a history of 222 years. Sky, Dragon, Tiger, Phoenix were the fifth generation. But how we pass it on depends on how every Sifu, every fellow practitioner, nurture their protégés. The requirements of current Kung Fu practitioners are far different from those in my grandmaster's time. Every hand movement, footwork and form of seven praying mantis are totally not up to scratch. This family of Kung Fu would lose its style. From the perspective of culture and research, to the extent that it has preserved many facets of training which were once popular 
in southern Chinese martial arts dwindled to only a few stars, which have kept these traditions alive, southern Prey Mantis being one of them. Practicing Kung Fu is tough. Some people have to earn a living, so many Kung Fu styles are already lost. Hakka tradition it remain relatively unknown outside of the martial arts community. Tignao, praying mantas, lam ga gao, lao man gao, etc., which are Hakka lineages who have an important role in the historical development of southern Chinese martial arts, but which are so obscure that even martial arts practitioners at large don't know about them. Many Kung Fu styles I had heard of when I was little have become extinct in Hong Kong. No matter how great the Sifu is, if he doesn't have protégés to carry on and pass it along, people grow old and the Kung Fu will disappear. Up next, martial arts masters moving with the times. Fai Xing, 50%. Pei Kua, 15%. And my grandmaster combine it and simplify it and call it Tyson Pequa. How movies have popularized Kung Fu lineages. Bruce Lee crafted his personality to represent the underclass, the exploited. The martial artist became someone much more important, someone small through his own training and discipline. He can empower the people around him. He can represent it of people who are without power. This and more when the Pearl Report returns. Welcome back to the Pearl Report. Only a handful of Kung Fu styles remain popular in Hong Kong, mainly due to their portrayal in films or practitioners' efforts to move with the times. Melissa Hecolea reports their perpetuation depends on the masters. Taishing Pequar is one of the few northern martial arts that became popular in Hong Kong, where southern kung fu dominates. It was created in the early 20th century by a native of Hubei, Kan Takai, who combined Taishing, or monkey kung fu, he learned from his sifu, with Pequar, which he got from his father, Kan Wing Gai, a famous military kung fu master. While working in Shanghai, Kan was invited by the Namo Association to teach Daixing Pequar in Hong Kong in 19... Namo was founded by a master of Hong Kun, which later adopted the saber routine of Daixing Pequar. The southern part of Kung Fu, they put more emphasis on the use of arm, fist, while our northern part of style um, will emphasize more on using of leg, kicking, somersaulting, and Chinese script. At six years old, Man Wing Kai started studying Taishing Pequar from his Sifu, Chan Sao Chung, a disciple of Kan Ta Kai, who had stayed to open a school. At 16, Man Wing Kai became assistant Sifu. Sin Lam Yuk came to the school at about that time. Originally, I went to look, to observe, but a senior student's opponent didn't show up. Other seniors suggested letting me try. My chief was reluctant to accept him. He was just like a foreign, not like a guai zai. Uh, not, not a local. In the early 70s, uh, the sifu, the thinking, is still very uh, reserved. Chinese kung fu must be taught to the Chinese. But I, I told my master, he is a born fighter. So my sifu said, okay, if you said that, you trade him. Was he tough on you? Uh, Sometimes. Right. Usually very hard. <laughs> but he can meet my requirement. Martial arts is not about fighting, but being prepared to fight. People will always think twice before they attack you. You do not say or do anything that you do, are not willing to see through. The first time I took him to the fight, his legs start trembling. Hey, I said, hey, hey, don't be frightened. I said, I said no, no, no. Uh, I'm very excited. I can't wait anymore. <laughs> he knocked out his opponent in 27 seconds. What we need is a fighting heart. So it proved my decision is correct. Six months of training, he became the Southeast Asia Championship. 
Every fight he KO'd, he KO'd his opponent. From 1969, Chan Sao Chung sent his students to the Southeast Asia Martial Arts Championships. Sin Lam Myuk won in 1973. Then movie offers poured in for Sin. They needed many actors who know Kung Fu. By chance, I got to know some veterans in the industry. He said, why don't you try since you are a champion already, right? The earlier films tended to be action films set in early Republic of China. Many were fighting films, so I think Taishing Pekwar looks good in action. Movie star, television star, but they come to learn Taishing Pekwar because our type of Kung Fu is uh, quite well looking, quite attractive. You can jump in, somersaulting. At the time, I signed with Gold Dig Films to make six movies, early Republic of China action films. Sin's Sifu Chan Sao Chung was also roped into films, starring in Monkey Fist in 1974. That cemented his status as Monkey King. Chan Sao Chung is the person who held it together. Dyson Pekwa would not be where it is today, that's for sure. So I think for a star to succeed, you need to have important masters for each successive generation. And certainly Chan Sao Chung played that role, and Master Man and indeed Master Sin are playing that role, continue the tradition. Today, Man Wing Gai teaches Daixing Pekwa in Shenzhen. The style never changed, but his training has changed. In the old days, we would do exactly what Sifu asked us to do, very obedient. And nowadays, you can't push the student to do what you want to do. Too hard, they feel pain. So man handpicks his disciples and teaches them for free. You are not up to my required standard. I won't teach you anything more. He's just trained five pupils. They will go back to Hope to be a Sifu. I hope that simple part of you carry on generation after generation. This type of traditional Kung Fu, if we don't promote after one decade, two decades, will be vanished. No more. So it was what a pity. One, two, one, two, say go, say. Sin Lam Yuk teaches both Taishing Pekwar and Muay Thai. I'm obsessed with both. Muay Thai is trendy now. In our times, it was Kung Fu. In the 80s, Sin competed in professional boxing in Hong Kong with Western counterparts. We had to wear 8-ounce boxing gloves. We used boxing gloves 4 ounces lighter in Chinese martial arts ring fighting, so you expend much more effort for the same results. And the Western ring is surrounded by ropes, while Chinese rings were not, and were much bigger. I simplified Taishing Pekwar moves, coordinated them with ring-style fighting, Wide and long movements consume great energy, so we mixed in Western short punches, hammering and hooking. Sin Lam Yuk is now vice president of the Hong Kong Muay Thai Association. He developed in that direction. I still stay in the traditional Daishin Pekwa Kung Fu. So we try to uh, promote in different ways only, but the result is the same. Choi Siu Ming started at age five acting in Cantonese operas. The fundamental skills of Cantonese opera and martial arts are totally the same. We have to practice waist and foot skills, somersault, pouncing, etc. So when I started learning Kung Fu at nine years old, I adapted quickly. At 21, he started directing his own martial arts films. 
I felt I had to learn many, many different kung fu styles to use them in my movies. I learned Hong Kun, the real Wing Chun. As long as I can use it in my movies, I'd learn it under a renowned Sifu. Through movies or dramas, people can get to know some of China's forgotten kung fu treasures. And through storylines, characters, and cinematography, promote the specialties of the families of kung fu. In 1981, Choi produced the TV drama The Legendary Falk, based on a contemporary kung fu master. Many thought it would flop. He thought the story has a compelling and important message to convey to the wider audience. It became a, a phenomenon in Hong Kong and it transformed the whole TV thing in, in mainland China as well. Choi's latest TV series about the Tai Chi Mantis style is set in China in the mid 1890s. In the Sino-Japanese War then, many urban heroes emerged, including a praying mantis grandmaster who was very patriotic and loved his people very much. This is a story of heroes in chaotic times. Within the community, people would tell stories about heroes, so many audience would form a special affection for martial arts heroes. Hong Kong had its own kung fu hero. In the golden era of Chinese kung fu movies, when they spread internationally, Bruce Lee was at the pinnacle. Bruce Lee projected a completely different image of um, martial arts. Um, whereas before, it's something that is tacked to the past. Brucey brought it back to contemporary times and make it exceptionally cool. He's not just a normal actor or superstar. He's a martial arts master in our hearts. Kang Chi Kung was so impressed, he sought out American-born Bruce Lee's chief Chinese disciple in the U.S., Ted Wong. Every year he came to Hong Kong and I attended his seminars until he noticed me. My Kung Fu brothers told him I was already a Wing Chun master. Besides Wing Chun, Kong had studied Tai Xing Pequar under Sin Lam Yuk. In 1999, he became Ted Wong's disciple. He only took on six people in Hong Kong. I was one of them. Unlike Chinese traditional sifus, he was very patient in teaching you. He likes asking us if we had any questions, if we understood. Ted Wong taught Jeet Kune Do, invented by Bruce Lee. It incorporates fencing, boxing, and Wing Chun. The concept of Jit Kune Do is to abolish things not suitable for you and simplify what's suitable, best into one step that includes time, speed, position and rigidness. It's in line with Wing Chun philosophy. Bruce Lee learned Wing Chun from Yip Man. Now Kong teaches both Wing Chun mixed with Jit Kune Do. In Wing Chun, there are some repetitive movements, but in our Jit Kune Do fighting, we are here, he hits me, I hit him here. Even if he hit me, I've already kicked him here. Even without hands, I can intercept him. Bruce Lee summed up his philosophy in a note to Ted Wong. It says one must be loyal to one's martial arts. Years afterwards, the most powerful martial art is your own freestyle martial art. Martial arts that survive seem to have moved with the times, gleaning the best from other styles or honed by new masters, perfected with each generation. If you look at the term Kung Fu, this is a Buddhist term. Kung Fu does not just refer to martial arts. Anything that requires cultivation, perseverance, time, that is Kung Fu. And through this, you discover something that's eternal, something that's universal, 
you discover the great Tao. Well, thank you for watching our show. It will be re-aired on Tuesday and Saturday as well as on TVB.com. Until next time, from the Pearl Report team, good night, good luck and good health.